This is Making Life Brighter, and my name is Winifred Adams. I'm your host today, and I'm sharing with you a very special three-part series with iconic photographer Guy Webster as he features his new book, Big Shots. I was lucky enough to sit down with him and have an enjoyable afternoon in his Venice Beach studio when it was absolutely teeming rain outside, and we had a fantastic conversation and radio interview about his life shooting as well as all the neat celebrities and iconic rock legends that he's shot over the years. We'll continue this series into the new year, but this rounds out a three-part series with some fantastic outtakes and these great stories from this very humble and very amazing artist. So check it out. Here we go with Guy Webster and his book, Big Shots. We've been talking with Guy about his career and shooting great music icons and how he had control over the industry that he worked in, unlike they do today. So Guy, tell us a little bit about your relationship with Bob Dylan. You have a huge portrait of him here on the wall, and who was Bob to you, and how did you meet Bob? Well, that's a great question, because um, I met him by chance for Columbia Records, asked me to do the photograph, and um, because they saw rock and roll called Guy. So I shot so many things for them for Columbia Records, and I was their West Coast photographer, even though I was working for other companies at the same time. But the thing about Bob is, I heard when I was in college, one of his first recordings out of New York City. I'm listening to this music, and, and I grew up in a musical family with songs day and night, and I had never heard anything like it. I was very much um, kind of into the Weavers and those kind of groups that sang American mm -hmm. folk songs. But Bob Dylan took the folk song to modern times. And man, I heard Masters of War for the first time. And I'm going, oh my God, who is this guy? And then I heard, you know, the times they are changing, things like that. But I listened to that album over and over again. And I never thought I was going to meet him because I wasn't into photography at the time. I was a political science major at school. But he influenced me because I said, God, there's somebody out there that thinks the way I do. Mm -hmm. Left wing, activist. Um, I was rapidly left wing. I grew up, you know, with um, the communist scare and McCarthyism. And I was, I so detested it. And I was so ashamed of America for buying into this kind of bullshit. And being a political science major, I understood that it was all about self-aggrandizement. Mm -hmm. That he was an insane man. But anyway, Bob Dylan spoke to me the truth. I know it. If I believed in God, I would say something from God came through his body and put out this incredible body of work. But it wasn't that. The timing was right. His education was right. He had great influences. New York City folk music scene. There's a great play that I just saw recently about this. But anyway, I listened to that stuff, and I kept telling my friend Terry Melcher, who was producing records, and he was producing The Birds and things like that, and I go, you gotta listen to Bob Dylan, keep listening to Bob Dylan. It's the future. And I was wrong, because it wasn't the future, but it did create some great songs, and... Uh, but it created a future. It didn't, it yeah, wasn't the future, but it created right. something that lasted even yes, it lasted, time. but uh, the kids today, they listen to a little Bob Dylan, but they don't know how powerful this was, because they're into their laptops and their... Well, they don't have the stuff. political scene that we had, no. you had then. I mean, They you know. could, but they don't choose to do it. Mm -hmm. The Millennium Gang, these young kids, I love them. Uh, they come through the studio, and they're great artists and musicians. I like them all, but they're just letting the world deal with itself. They're not going to contribute money to any particular cause. They're not going to go march. Mm -hmm. It takes somebody with a lot of money to go to Washington and march. Right, right. you got to get an airline ticket. you got to make a sign and go out there and <laughs> get a hotel. Very expensive. But anyway, that's sidetracking. So Bob Dylan was my guy. I sort of put everybody, you know, like Peter, Paul, and Mary, sweet. You know, very harmless, sweet lefties, which I liked. But Bob Dylan was the real deal. And there were others like him. But well, he, he didn't apologize for what he believed in. No. He put it forward. Yeah, and uh, I just, that was it. So he changed me politically because I became more of an activist after listening to his music. 
and I talk to people about him a lot. Mm -hmm. My parental age group, uh, my father's families and like that, I let them know who Bob Dylan was. And, and what was your relationship with him? How, what was it like to work with him? Well, I worked with him at Columbia Records, mm -hmm. and I did that iconic shot. I love that shot, by the way. Thanks. It's like coming up underneath his jawline, and you sort yeah. of get that. He has a glint in his eye, like a little bit of mischief, or he's yeah. thinking something. But that's all. I just worked with him that afternoon and then <coughs> at Columbia Records, but then I worked with him many years later. It must have been 15 years ago at some show where I was on stage with him and took some pictures, but he was getting pretty haggard and tired looking at that time. But that was the time. He influenced me. He was the best or biggest influence in my life. He and a man named Alan Watts was the great Buddhist teacher. Um, he, he was an alcoholic and probably a, a playboy, but it's not him that I was studying. It was what he was preaching. What he was, yeah. It was, he was really What he good. was being. Is there someone in music that stands out for you besides Bob? A uh, shoot that you did that was just like over the top? Yeah, you? well, there's one group that I'm still enthralled with, and that's Captain Beefheart and his magic band. <laughs> uh, people today don't know him, but they're very collectible. And their music is so avant-garde from the period that today it's even avant-garde. Mm -hmm. That's how good this group was. Where were they? They were in L.A. Mm -hmm. He was Don Van Fleet, and his photographs are some of my favorite. And I'm going to do a show of just Captain Beefheart. Great. And in the movie, uh, what's the name of the movie? Revolution? Or High Fidelity. High Fidelity. The movie High Fidelity, they show my album cover of Captain Beefheart as the one album they're not going to sell to anybody. It's that collectible. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. So I feel really That's proud bad. about that. Oh, fantastic. And I, I did two major covers for them, and I just loved him. As a matter of fact, he comes into my studio, and um, he goes, uh, so Guy, uh, have you heard my music? I go, no, I've never heard your music. And he says, well, it's kind of Abba Zabba. I go, no kidding, Abba Zabba. <laughs> so I went out and bought an Abba Zabba candy bar, and I used that for the graphics on the cover. Oh, I love it. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, so See, but I, I had a great relationship with him. That's fun, passion. Now, you've obviously worked with a lot of Hollywood, and we have just a few minutes before our break, but we'll, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your relationship with Natalie Wood. You have her in this book, and you know she's just come up recently again in the news of that whole situation to her, her life and death. And While I'm eating meat, I'll tell you about Natalie. <laughs> tell us about okay. Natalie. You can watch me eat this. <laughs> One more. All right. Natalie was a good friend. Mm -hmm. She was a friend of yours. Yeah. And a friend of my first wife. Mm -hmm. um, she was damaged goods. Maybe having a very strong, strange mother. I'm not sure what it was. She was very vulnerable. She needed a man to take care of her. And to love her. And she chose bad guys. And so... How did you come to know her? Well, I double dated with her. Oh, ah, okay. We'd go out, the four of us. Mm -hmm. She had this guy, weird boyfriend. All of her boyfriends were weird. RJ may be okay, I don't know. I've met him, but I don't know if he's a good guy. But I'm suspicious about her death. I, I imagine they, you might be. Yeah, I think they probably heard her crying for help and didn't do anything because they were drunk. Mm-hmm. And she was mad at them. Anyway, that's my call. I, I may not be correct. But um, I photographed her numerous times. And the one that I like, I've got it here on the wall somewhere. Oh, I think it's in the other room. Uh, this funny story about that was, we had this great relationship, and she was very comfortable with me. We're out in the country, and a limo drives by. And it's Jim Morrison in the limo. And the window goes down, and this bearded fat guy, I, he says, Guy, what are you doing? Man? Who is this? Who are you? I had no idea it was Jim. No he was way. so out of shape. He says, yeah, I'm moving to Paris. I'm leaving in a week. I said, God, that's so weird, because I'm moving to Spain. I'm going to buy a house over in Menorca. But we'll stay in touch. If you're in Paris, I'll come see you. And so we shook hands, and I introduced him to Natalie. 
and she enjoyed meeting him, and he enjoyed meeting her. But he never left the car because he was enormous, you know. So he pulls out, and I never saw him again. And you know, I, I moved to Europe, and he moved to Europe, and he died soon after. It's like fate. Yeah. He was almost saying goodbye to you in a sense. In a way, because you, you know? know, we went to college together, at UCLA. So I knew him from his straight days before. He was the Lizard King, you know. What was it like to know somebody that way and then all of a sudden you see them larger than life and the world worships them and then, No, they didn't you know. worship him when I saw him for that shoot for the album cover. Right. Uh, that was our first shoot together. He walked into my studio and says, Guy, I'm going, who are you? He said, I'm Jim. You know, we went to school together, UCLA, yeah. and in philosophy class. Oh my God, because he had long hair with the ribbon shirts and stuff like that. Before that, we were in UCLA garb, you know, khakis and a polo shirt or whatever it was. So it was great to see him again. And that's why I also felt confident with the group. I knew their music. I liked it. And so I said, well, take your shirt off. Yeah. And in the movie, because I wasn't good for the film, they used a girl, an actress, to be the photographer in the film, and she says, take your shirt off, and made it a sexy thing. I never did it for that. I knew he was so beautiful, with the hair, and it was Jesus-like, that I got to put that on the cover. That's fantastic. And so I put the guys in the, in the other eye, it's actually this eye here, and um, they were pissed off with it, because they weren't large like, like Jim. But it worked. I knew it was gonna work. It I worked. had control. You understand? Yeah. Because the art directors at Electro, anything I wanted to do, I could do. I mean, and every album I did was number one in the country. So they go, oh, let's, we'll go with what Guy says. And you won an award uh, by Rolling Stone, right? Well, not Rolling for that Stone one. Magazine? That was for Procol Harum. Ah, okay. Yeah. Very good, very good. Well, we'll be right back with some more Guy Webster. You're listening to Making Life Brighter. We're here featuring today his book, Big Shots, and if you're interested in buying the book, it's a great gift, and it's a coffee table book you'll look after many, many, many times. It's on Amazon.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And we're back. This is Making Life Brighter, and we're here today with Guy Webster, iconic photographer with his amazing book, Big Shots. So, Guy, we were talking about all the huge artists that you've shot and the people you've been friends with for, you know, all these years, and these pictures in this book are astounding, but I love the stories that go with them, and that's why this book is so special. It has these the stories, the history, and I'd like to ask you about Joan Hackett. She, there's a black and white photo toward the end of the book, and tell us a little bit about why this is such a meaningful picture to you. Yeah, it's meaningful because um, I really liked her. I liked her as an actress. She was an intellect, um, very interesting woman, and she had a dark side, which I saw right away. And she let me photograph that. When that's very vulnerable, you know, to right. allow that and let you in there. And so I've always liked that photograph. I have many shots of her, but that's the one I choose for myself. That great sadness, it's something, this is going to sound self-aggrandizement, but I have that sadness. Okay, it's in me. It's part of my Spanish blood. And it goes with being Spanish. That kind of great deep sadness. Yet. I get through life happy and joyful. It's a decision I make. But I'm sad for the state of the world and that we're no better or worse than a pride of lions. We'll kill whatever we want for food. There's nothing going to stop us. If we want oil, we will kill 250,000 innocent people to keep our oil. And we've done it. And we do it over and over again. Being a political science major, studying in the University of Copenhagen, I would see from afar what America really does in the world. Americans in this country know nothing about what's going on, the subtext. Having studied political science, I know the shit that we've done to the world. Not only that, but we're a great country too. So we're balanced, but we are not far from blame. I mean, we are, everything we're doing in the Middle East for our oil mm -hmm. and control is causing all this anti-Americanism. We're not supposed to be there. Leave them alone. But until we get off oil, we're gonna keep starting wars. Yeah, and hopefully that's gonna change very soon here. Well, that's the sadness I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's in me every day. 
the, the plight of humanity. Yeah, and also <laughs> man's inhumanity to man. Right. If you look on the SPCA, the abuse to animals is crazy. Uh, dogs are beaten and made to fight and thrown away when they're getting sick. They just leave them out for somebody else to deal with. Uh, we have a very strong, I would say, 40% of the country is uneducated to what's going on. Well, they're hypnotized, hypnotized yeah. away from what they don't want to see that's uncomfortable. Football and, and beer. Yeah. That's it, football and beer. And I understand it. They're both wonderful. It's not that I care well, about beer, but I like football. When, <laughs> when you were shooting some of these um, movie stars and rock stars, surely you were in dangerous situations. Uh, only once. Yeah? Yeah, I'll tell you the story. Because you asked me earlier about a dangerous uh, shooting. Uh -huh. Well, there were two. One is kind of minor. Have you ever heard of David Cassidy? Yes. Okay. David Cassidy was a giant star in 1970 to 74. And I was traveling with him throughout Europe in private planes and buses and all of that. And he did Wembley Stadium. And he was as big as the Beatles. I know it sounds crazy, but I was there, I can tell you. And I'm up against the glass wall outside of Wembley Stadium waiting to get in. And the crowd is surging, and we're almost overrun by the crowd. They had to bring dogs out to, to scare the people back. And my back was against the wall of window, and it was becoming concave. And I knew it was going to crack, and I was going to go through. I could kill myself. Thank God the dogs came and scared the people off. That was scary physically. Mentally, Electra Records said, hey, I got this group. We want you to do the cover for it. I go, yeah, what's their name? The Holy Modal Rounders. Now, I've told this story to only a couple people. Very few people know this. And I go, oh, OK, I, I know who they are. I've never heard their music, but I'd be happy to work with them. Because the leader was the guy who wrote Zabriskie Point for Antonioni. So he was a sentient being, supposedly. So I said to him, let's go shoot. He says, no, we're not ready yet. We're going to call you as soon as we're ready for the shoot. Can you wait? And I go, sure, you call me when you're ready. Four in the morning, like two weeks later, I get a call. Guy, come on over now. We're at the motel. We want you. We want you to shoot us in the motel room. I go, okay. Four in the morning, no problem. I call my two assistants, two guys. They gather up the cameras and the lights. And we go over to the motel. We open the door. And they're all naked on the bed with needles in their arms. <laughs> and I'm going, you want me to shoot this? <laughs> For the cover? Are you crazy? He goes, yeah, I just want this for the cover. We'll work it out, don't we? We'll work it out. We'll get it done. At that time, you know, I shoot a couple shots. The girl in the group, who's entwined like a snake, gets up and pees on my tripod. OK? I'm going, that's it. I'm out of here. And we packed up everything and we left. And that was the worst shooting ever. Yeah. Four in the morning. Yeah, four in the morning. And my wife is going, you know, what are you doing for the money going to a shoot? I said, this is a rock group. You know? <laughs> That's fantastic. So, of course, the, oh, God. the album came out with just graphics on it. No, yeah. no photographs. But it makes, um, you know, rock and roll ruining the furniture in the hotel room look mild. Yeah. Well, look up <laughs> Holy Modal Rappers. The music wasn't that bad. <laughs> Strange. Listen, can you do that? Yeah. Look it yeah, up Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know. What it, what's the difference for you between shooting the males that you've shot and the females that you've shot? Well, How do you approach that? Well, a great difference, a difference. I mean, it's monumental. The men are comfortable with how they look. Ah, interesting. They're an actor. Right. Or they're a rock star. They don't need makeup unless that's part of their act. Mm -hmm. So they don't care. A female is always just a little overweight. Can you do something about that? Yeah, we'll wear black. Um, full makeup, retouching, all of that. They are, you know, they're scared to death. It's their image. And I was really good with women because I would say, look, nothing goes out of my studio unless you like it. I nice. promise you that. Oh, we'll that's nice. We'll never do that. And if you get into a problem with the media, I'm not going to release photographs to the press unless you want me to. You're a god. And, yeah, so <laughs> they were so comfortable with me and then would do anything. And then I would, if I had to retouch them, which I did, very seldom did. The ones in this book are not retouched. That's what's so brilliant about your work. It, yeah. it, it, it's so it's lovely to look at. Thank you. It's all lighting. If the light's right, you don't need to retouch it. 
I think when the mood's right, and it's clear that you do that with these subjects, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, well, once in a while, uh, we'd smoke a joint together if it seemed to relax them, if they asked for it, or white wine. Women like white wine. And I would allow that, even though it could make their eyes a little blurry. I could fix that later, but I wanted them to relax and have fun with it. But in terms of mood and, and dealing with you, because you're getting in deep with these people, what's yeah, that? I'm also naked with them. They're, they're naked, I'm not. I mean, I'm back there while they're getting dressed. They're all comfortable with it, you know? Right. Particularly in the 70s. Women were aggressive sexually. It was a whole different world, and there were no diseases you had to worry about. You didn't have to worry about getting pregnant. The pill was around. So yeah, we I also think aggressive. that you didn't have the internet the way it is today, right, and people right. who were in the artistic realms in the world could be artistic that's without right. the rest of the world going, oh my God. And yeah. you know, if you were honorable and not releasing photos of people, they probably could actually be who they were. Well, I have a funny story for you. Do you have time for it? Yeah. Okay. I have 30 seconds. Okay, well, really? <laughs> that's not much, but I'll try to squeeze it in. Here we go. So I'm photographing Raquel Welsh, who was a friend. I'd photographed her numerous times, liked her. We lived near each other, and she was hot. And my wife was jealous of her, and I said, you have no reason to be jealous. I don't fool around, and she's just a friend that I photograph. So she comes to my studio, my wife, while I'm photographing Raquel, and she's peeking in the window. I don't know this, right? And this is, well, I've yeah. got my hairdresser and the makeup people, the clothing people there, and Raquel turns around and goes, guy, zip me up, would you? So I zip her up, and my wife watches me do that, and I hear a knock on the door, <laughs> and she says, come out here for a minute, I want to talk to you. Go, what is it? I didn't even know what was the problem. She says, I saw you zipping up her dress. I said, I zip up everybody's dress. You know, I don't always have people around me. It's nothing. And she says, well, here, try this. And she takes her wedding ring off and throws it in the parking lot at my oh, studio, no. and I hear this go, Dink, 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 down the parking lot and disappear. Oh, and I'm going, no. what have I done? Why did I get married, you know? <laughs> and But she was a wonderful woman, but she was so jealous of me for no reason. Oh. I never did anything. It just meant that she joy. loved you. Well, it meant that she was having an affair. <laughs> oh, no. Well, so, yeah, whatever somebody reacts to, they're worried about themselves. Oh, my gosh. Sure. Was she having an affair? Not then, but later. Oh, no. Yeah, well, because I was traveling all the time. And when she finally told me, I go, that's okay. I'm gone for six weeks at a time. If you have to have an affair, I don't care. Uh -huh. well, it's part of the Buddhism thing, too, you know. You don't own anybody. I don't want to own anybody. I don't want to support You just them. get to experience people, and that's what just you've done in this them. book. Just love them. That's it. Well, there you have it, everybody. Yeah. Guy Webster, this has yeah. been such a pleasure. Thank you so very much. Darling, I loved it. Love to have Let's you. Let's do it again, yes. and I can talk Let's for chat hours. some more. Yeah. And uh, Big Shots, everybody, on Amazon.com. You're listening to Making Life Brighter. This is Music Month on Making Life Brighter. And you go jolly. Thank you for watching and listening. This is Making Life Brighter. My name is Winifred Adams, and that was Guy Webster featuring his new book, Big Shots. If you'd like more information, go to makinglifebrighter.com, and you can always find Guy at guywebster.com as well. Thank you for watching. We'll be back in the new year with more Guy Webster and much, much more to come. Because this is one of my favorite photographs I've ever taken. Really? That's Nico of the Velvet Underground. Mm -hmm. I loved her. She's got amphetamine lips. She was a stoner. Mm -hmm. I just love that picture. And it's become one of my best sellers. It's very moody and kind of... Uh, well, I like it. It's a perfect it's, woman. It speaks. And she's so dangerous. She was so fucking dangerous. <laughs> but I mean, those eyes, mm -hmm. that she did her makeup for her, well, because she'd been a model. Mm -hmm. Well, she yeah. has the model cheekbones. And yeah. You caught, you caught the, you know, well, I used the light. light and yeah, and then I now. darkened her hair, so mm -hmm. her face would just pop up. She's actually blonde. Really? Yeah, I'll show you. Oh, but see, I can do whatever I want. Nobody ever. This is what she really. Oh yeah, yeah, right. But I can do whatever I want. She's the perfect twenty degrees. Well, she, Brian Jones, was having an affair with her. There you are. Yeah, but that's one of my favorite pictures. It's and gorgeous. Th there's, um, well, there's a lot of favorite pictures. This one's kind of funny, and the reason is they printed it backwards, not in the book for the album cover. So we had to run it this way. Really? Yeah, they wanted the type to be here. Oh. So that somehow they or they made a mistake and they printed it the wrong way. So it says aftermath. Huh. There. That's fantastic. Anyway, this is Brian as I knew him. And 
he was like my favorite at the time. And I like this one of Mick because this is one that had never been seen. It's going to be in the Tashin book. This is the first time it's been shown to anybody. I but, like it because it it's kind of moody. It's kind of young, but it's without too much attitude yet. Yeah. It still has, it has this kind of. Oh, he would give me attitude later. I just got that one. You know, when you get them alone. Mm -hmm. see, this is the one that's becoming famous now. Yeah. These are the ones that gave me that experience I told you about. As oh, I looked right, at these, yeah. I mean, I had such a bizarre Well, let thing me show happen. you where this was. It was on a hillside, sort of somewhere in no, England? No, no, it? it looks like it, no. It's actually, I had a, this is before I was married, I think. My girlfriend had a ranch or family. Yeah, yeah, this is what I was looking yeah, at. Well, exactly. we were back over here shooting that one. And this is a reservoir mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills in the Doheny Ranch. Have you heard the name Doheny? Yes, yes. Yeah, that was my fiance. Oh my goodness. Funny, huh? Yeah. How did you get them all up there and to do that? You said, hey, we're gonna go here and we're gonna shoot this, like come with me? They did whatever I wanted. I had the limo and I just put them in the back of the and they smoke dope if they want, whatever they want. They just, they just did it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's it. And then that's fantastic. there's Groups like this, I don't know why they put this in. There's so many famous groups. This is the seeds. Mm -hmm. You're working too hard, you're working too hard, you're working too hard for me. Anyway, that was, of course, you don't know the seeds. My brothers, though, you brought music that? forward for, okay. yes, that's how I know some yeah, of these but things. That's funny, that they, but they like the picture, the, the publishers, because mm -hmm. it's rock and roll. But this, very is, cool. this is very important. Yeah, this was really interesting. This Tell me about this, first because it's so. For sale photograph. Really? Dean Martin bought it for his den. It was big. And these were just two girls who worked for me, mm -hmm. um, both redheads. And I said, come on, we're going down there. And you see how diffused it is? Yeah. I put oil on the lens to make it look like a, sort of like a Watteau painting or like a, uh -huh. well, what would you call it? Yeah. Impressionist of a right. kind, you know, where there's nothing defined and sharp. And I love that picture. And so for that, <coughs> I remembered that location, and I took the stones down there for a back cover. Sweet. Yeah, that's fun. That's and then great. this is <clears throat> Arthur Lee and Love. Hard to get them all together. I had to do this in one print in the dark room. Really? Yeah. How'd you do that? I didn't cut anything out. I just... Yeah, how'd you do that? I took an area and, and cut out this, black that out. And printed that, then I covered that, and oh, just wow. that, and then like that, and I did him half the page, and it was big, you know, like that. And you did it all yourself by all hand. Myself, yeah. Did you but, do that for all these album covers? Well, everything was in the dark room, you know, but uh, you did it though. Oh yeah, yeah, I did all the printing. Mm -hmm. And this is a guy that I've worked with a lot, you know, Johnny Rivers, and we're still friends today, yeah. after all these years. But I just love the tie dye yeah. and the, these colors. And he was very artistic back then. Now he looks like uh, a Jewish businessman. <laughs> but back then, <laughs> and so this we used for the cover. Mm -hmm. oh, the two of us together here. Uh, we're big shots. By the way, I had to fight for that name. <laughs> you fight. did? Oh, yeah. Why? They thought it was too cute. And I said, no, nope, it's big shots. I think it's great. Well, because you speaks... remember it. Right. Well, yeah. it, it speaks. Of well, exactly what's happening. Yeah. All right.